The breathing, Menezvate Raya Jelinska. My name is Raisa Jelinski. Today, I'll be interviewing Christia Truchak, our third alumni of the alumni video series. Christia is the founder and CEO of Decidium, a global design studio. Previously, she was a chief design officer for the University of Ottawa. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Great to be here. Uh, so the first question we'll start with is, where did you go to university and what did you study? So um, I grew up in Sudbury and I came to Ottawa initially to go to journalism school at Carleton University. Um, so I've, I've done two degrees at Carleton. I ended up not doing a German degree. I ended up doing a degree in Soviet and East European studies as my undergrad. And then I did a master's of public administration. And right back to back, I went to the University of Ottawa and I did a master's, of, of an MBA. And then a few years later, when I was working, I went back to school part-time uh, to the University of Ottawa again and I did a Bachelor of Visual Arts. Okay. Um, so our second question is, uh, what was your involvement in SUSC? Uh, I pretty much did something about everything <laughs> in a lot of different roles. Um, I, I was introduced to SUSC through a, a, a friend of mine that I met my first month in university, um, and that was the Carleton USC Club. So I got involved in USC and I loved it because it really, um, it was a big tent, like it didn't matter where you came from, it didn't matter whether you spoke Ukrainian or not, or whether you were part of Zoom or FOST or whatever. Um, the community was open, and so uh, I think that's one of the greatest strengths that SUSC has is that openness and that willingness to embrace anyone who wants to play. Um, so I, I at, at a very high level, I ended up being a Congress coordinator for National Congress one year in Ottawa, where we held the Congress um, at Ottawa, Ottawa U+. Plus we held our banquet and everything on Parliament Hill. So uh, there were some of us that remember actually doing a con around the, 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 the flame there at three o'clock in the morning, which you cannot do any longer anywhere there. Um, so I did the, I was a Congress coordinator. Also, I, I ran Student, I was the editor of Student. We ran that out of Ottawa for a few years. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and it was um, the old students, so where you hand laid out the, the newspaper and uh, um, yeah, it was a very, very different world than the digital world that we live in now. And I was, uh, I was president of SUSC for a year, um, where I think the greatest accomplishment or achievement in that particular year was getting rid of the debt. So that was, a, that was a <laughs> the main focal point for, for the executive at that time. So I, I, I did a lot of different things and um, I really had a lot of fun. It was, it was an awesome experience and I got to meet tremendous people that have become lifelong friends. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing with that. Um, you know, something that we do pride ourselves on is, you know, it doesn't matter what you did before you went to university. Like, if you're Ukraine or if you're interested in supporting the Ukrainian community, like, become part of Sosk. So good to hear you say that and that it's been like that for a long time. Uh, the third question is, what was your involvement in your USO? Well, so it, it was. You guys interviewed Mikhailo Batsurki, so I I was. In university with Mikhail at the same time. So the USK, the Ottawa USK, the Carlton USK, not Ottawa, because I don't think there was a, uh, an USK at, at Ottawa U at the time, um, was kind of the linchpin for students in the Ottawa community. And so, but, but also because it's in the nation's capital, we did a lot of things that typically USKs wouldn't do. Like, for example, um, I remember one Christmas where uh, it was organized, we, we ended up going to the governor general's house to hold, a, 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 I think it was a Rizdvo celebration and, there, and it was done in Ukrainian. It was really interesting. Um, so typically, you, you know, Usk would not do that in another city because you just don't have access to these kinds of things. So, so yeah, so we did all kinds of different things. I mean, um, you know, the projects, we talked about the multimedia, uh, I think Mikhailo talked about this, the multimedia uh, MMSDP is all I remember project. I was on that project as well. Uh, with three or four other students, and that was that was amazing. And we were able to piggyback on our experience with the um, CKCU uh, uh, Ukrainian radio show that we had, and be able to launch a, a lot of the content that we gathered in the in the program on that particular platform. So, even though I didn't go to school in journalism per se, as I initially wanted, I got a lot of media experience just by virtue of us being where it was and the opportunities that, uh, you know, a national capital region and also the, the local head of, like, head of the federal government being here um, enabled us to really become familiar with the processes of making decisions, political and policy decisions, and also to be able to influence and access funds at the time. 
for example, through the Multiculturalism Secretariat. So yeah, so it was, it was, it was like this mixture. It wasn't just plain Usk. It was Usk plus Susk, and then the Hromada all rolled into one. Oh, I mean, it sounds like I should have gone to school in Ottawa because it sounds like very interesting opportunities. Um, and the next question is, what is your current occupation? So um, in on May 1st, I launched my startup. It's called Decidium. And I use design uh, of design philosophy and a set of processes, including Lego, to help people solve problems. And, um, and so I launched this after a career in the federal public service where I was, um, I did a lot of different things. I was a trade negotiator of on the original NAFTA deal. Um, I worked in fisheries. I ran an, a, a gas, a gas a pipeline agency for the, the government of Canada. Um, I worked in the prime minister's office, uh, all kinds of stuff. So it was, a, it was a really very kind of crazy uh, public service career. And in the last uh, few years, I did a branch in science and economic development Canada. So they're the department that's responsible for pushing forward a lot of the money related to innovation uh, programs in the country. And so I ran their innovation lab and that we using design as a, as a basis for creating policies and uh, programs, et cetera. So um, that was a lot of fun, but it was hard because innovation and government don't necessarily go together <laughs> in terms of operations. So um, I did that. And then I ended up uh, just before leaving, I, I went to the university of Ottawa for two years and I, I reported to the rector there and I was the first chief design officer for the university. And it turns out I was the first chief design officer in the country uh, at a university. So I used the same skills and tools I had in my lab and I brought them to the university environment. So in that case, I helped them. Um, we used Lego series play as a way to reimagine what the university would look like in 2030. Um, and I helped them reimagine uh, the whole um, alumni experience as well. So it was, uh, it was challenging, but it was also really rewarding because as an alumna, it was great to go back home to my school, one of my schools, and be able to help them. So, um, so that's what I'm doing now is, is through this company I'm, I'm working with, um, I think it's about 12 or 15 female founders around the world. And we, we bundle together as we need to, to work on projects that have social impact in, uh, in its sort of basic foundation. So, um, and it's new. So COVID, I started a company in the middle of a pandemic. I'm not sure there's many people who would want to do that, um, but I did. So we'll see how it goes. And, uh, you know, the world has shifted considerably right now and uh, systems are not working, social systems, economic systems, etc. And so it's time to start reimagining what a real world should look like. Um, a little bit off script here, but why did you choose to, is it, is it kind of the mandate of the company to support female founders or um, well, why, why that? Yeah, it's a good question. It was really funny because I didn't start out that way. So I have my company, I have my studio. And then I've allied, created a network that we've all agreed we're gonna kind of hang together as a sisterhood for a year and just see how we can work together um, on you know, pro bono projects, on projects that are uh, you know, profitable, et cetera. So we're just feeling our way out of there. But it was funny when I was looking at, because I realized very early on, you can't do things yourself, right? That's one of the lessons Cisco taught me as well as you, you can't do things yourself. You need, you need a posse, you need a group of people around you that you can trust, family, friends, et cetera. And so I thought, well, I can't do this work by myself. So who do I want to work with? And I, there's a technique in design where you mind map out, sort of you, um, you draw a little map of things uh, depending on the issue you're, you're working on. So that's what I did. I said, who do I want to work with? And I mind mapped out, drew this mind map. And I looked at the end of, this took a few days. I looked at it and it was all women. <laughs> and they were all women founders in Pakistan and Australia, across Canada. And I just, I thought, okay, I have nothing to lose. I'll pick up the phone and we'll have a chat and see if, you know, they're into, to developing this kind of a network. And I, I tell you, I was floored. It was, it, it took me less than 30 seconds to get into it. And it, people were saying, yes. So we're gonna try it, we're trying it now. And um, it's not easy, time zones are not easy and great, but, um, but I've been told by many people that there are very few organizations, female led companies or studios in this case, that have deliberately created a, a network of female founders who are all very bright and smart and different, but have a, a, um, a leading edge in terms of what they bring to their space, their design space, and trying to work together. And it's very appealing from a diversity perspective, but I just think it's really smart business, <laughs> bottom line. So, um, so yeah, so that's what, what we're trying to do. I think I definitely agree with that. Um, if, from what I've seen in kind of the career trajectory that I'm going on, um, it's pretty male-based and 
I think like understanding the need for female empowerment and females in positions of power, such as like, you know, even like boards, um, I yeah. think that it's very important. Um, yeah, and, it, and um, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of chutzpah to get to a stage where you're comfortable, you're comfortable and you're confident enough just to do it. Because it's very easy to talk yourself out of it, whether you're a guy or girl, it doesn't really matter. Like it, it can be very easy to talk yourself out of things. But if you find that sort of fortitude, and, and I, I would say Zeus gave me a lot of this as well, the confidence moving forward, um, the ability to work and try experiment with so many different activities, whether it was laying out student in a parliamentary hill office of an MP, which we did, which we did over a weekend, to, um, you know, to organizing the first Ukrainian major lobby campaign in the country, which was the Shane Commission lobby that Susk did in 1980, I think it was 1986, where we brought in 25, I think it was students from across the country. And I organized this with two of my, my, my fellow Suskites here in Ottawa. And we had student teams, we had student teams pulled together uh, based on a whole bunch of different analytics at that time analysis in terms of what writings they represented, their political views, et cetera, et cetera. And created these teams, booked appointments with MPs and cabinet ministers. And for that week, those teams, those SUSC teams went out and talked to MPs and cabinet ministers about the SUSC position in terms of war criminal extradition. And this was the first time that the Ukrainian community ever, ever did such a large and expansive lobby, let alone a lobby on an extremely difficult, sensitive political issue. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Like not many people realize that, but the, the people, the students in SUSC who went through that program, they're some of the mo movers and shakers in the country politically in the banking industry, um, in the arts. Um, and so that's the kind of experimentation and openness and opportunity that SUSC can offer if you're willing to step up and take it. And so I think that's a, a really um, unique aspect of what's, at least in my generation, what SUSC offered. We didn't have, like we did not have an immigration from Ukraine coming forward, repopulating our student body. It was us. It was Canadian students. And so our, our focus was very um, diverse, if I can say it that way. It wasn't just advocating for, for uh, human rights in the Soviet Union, which we did. And we, we protested in front of the Soviet embassy at the time in Ottawa. Again, some things that you, you couldn't do if you were in Calgary, but if because we were physically in Ottawa, you were able to do that. I remember having students bust in from Toronto and from Hamilton to come and protest with us. So, it was a particular, that set of issues was particularly interesting and passionate. But then there were these issues in Canada and the Duchenne Commission was a good example of that where Canadian citizens, Ukrainians and others, uh, East Europeans were materially affected by the policy decisions that the government of Canada was looking at making from a judicial, from a judicial standpoint. And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, having a voice that could resonate and cut through the noise on something that was that difficult an issue and that that passionate of an issue and also really hard emotionally for many people um, was to be able to say no we have a voice this Ukrainian student movement has a voice we have something to say that's not just not different so much from the mainstream community but takes a different perspective and we need to say it and not just say it we need to demonstrate it and that lobby demonstrated that I'll, ne I'll never forget it in Ottawa uh, on the hill you used to be able to ride these yeah you know, these green buses, you can't do this anymore. But you used to be able to hop on a bus and go from center block to east block to what have you, so you didn't have to walk. And I remember students, because the students would come back to the hotel we rented, and every day we had debriefs of what MP said. We took notes so that everyone could hear each other's perspectives. And so we could agilely move the yardstick in terms of who else do we need to see because so-and-so said we should talk to so-and-so, but we didn't have an appointment. So we did all this logistical stuff. And I'll never forget one team came back and they said, I think we found the prime minister. And I what do you mean, we didn't have an appointment. With no, or the leader of the opposition. I think we, yeah, we ran into him on a bus, on one of those little uh, buses. He had heard about the lobby from his colleagues and asked the students to come back and make an appointment with them. So the impact the students had within three or four days of being on the Hill was they plastered Parliament Hill and all the MPs offices Virtually, I think it was when we last counted, if I remember correctly, almost 85 to 90% of those MPs 
met with a team of Ukrainian Canadian students from Sousk to discuss a, a, a really tough issue. So for me, the Duchesne lobby and that experience and that camaraderie and those lifelong friendships, especially from that experience, showed me the power of what uh, Ukrainian students could do, students in general, Ukrainian students in, in this case particularly, could do when given the opportunity and seizing it. So um, a little bit long on that, but I think it's important to understand that was a huge, huge, huge step in the Hamada. And I haven't seen a step like that, not just from Suez, but from the Hamada since then. It's very interesting. Um, so the next question, and I think we've covered a bit of this um, already, but uh, it's uh, how do you think Suez helped you advance in your career and or personal development? Yeah, I never looked at Suez as advancing my career. I never, like, honestly, the whole thing about, you know, networking and core signal as skill sets and all that stuff. I never thought about that. I always thought about what, how can I make my parents proud? And there were some occasions that I didn't, trust me. Um, <laughs> they got really ticked off at me at what some of the stuff I was doing. Um, but, but it was, for me, it was the ability to affect change and make a difference. To say, I was here and I helped, I helped me move the yardstick forward. And I did it with my friends, right? <laughs> I did it with people I really liked. I did it at a time in my life where I could make tons of mistakes and that's okay. That's what life is for and to be as a student. Um, and it was really special too, because at that time, Susk didn't take no for an answer. And Susk also did not bow down to the Ukrainian community elites. Susk had its own voice and the louder, the more disruptive, the better. And that's what it should be. Susk should be challenging. Susk should be um, disruptive in a positive way for change, advocating change. And, uh, and Susk should not, uh, be dismissed uh, or be beholden to any organization, financially, politically, or, or anything. Because I think that's the beauty of what SUS for me was, was this independent, vocal, dynamic, crazy group of people that I just love to be with. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, so our last question is, do you have any tips for current students? These tips can be related to SUSK, the Ukrainian community, or general tips from that you'd like to share? Yeah, why don't I just, I'll use an example because it's probably better illustrative ones. So um, I think I think it's important to be able to seize opportunity when it comes by. And sometimes that's hard to find and to, to notice, but I that's that's what I try to do with SOS. So if I um, saw something that I've, I've never done before and I wanted to try, I would put my hand up and I would try. Um, and sometimes opportunities and just putting your hand up, it's actually stepping out and saying something. And by that, I mean, um, the example I'm going to use is, is when I, I was in graduate school, actually. So I, I, most of my SUSC stuff was in undergrad, and I barely scraped by. <laughs> you talk to a lot of people who really were into it. That's pretty much it. And I decided I needed to go to grad school because I wanted to work in the foreign service, and they weren't taking people who didn't have a master's degree. So that was my logic. So I was doing my master's in public admin. And... And I had, I had come across, I had met Dr. Uh, Mitra Sipinik, who used to be the UCC president years ago. He was from Sask uh, Saskatoon. And Dr. Sipinik was this incredibly progressive, smart guy who at the time was in his 60s, I think I met him. He just loved students. He just wanted to support you know, the youth movement and everything. And I said to him, I remember talking to him one time and I said, listen, you know what is missing in the Hamada? Um, <laughs> it's huge. And coming from Ottawa, this you can understand why this is sort of coming to fruition. Is we don't have a parliamentary internship program for Ukrainian Canadian students. And I think we should. And he turned around and he said, do it, write it up, pull it together. So I did. So I think it was 1987, 87, 88. That's what we did. So Cook supported a parliamentary internship program for Ukrainian Canadian students. And the logic was, um, we needed to grow our own policymakers. We needed to grow the next generation of politicians. We needed to grow the next generation of leaders in the community, not just in the Ukrainian community, but in the broader Canadian context. And that the internship program was a way and a means, another tool to do that. And one of the things I remember telling him was, we cannot, you can't take a student and put them in a program like this and then expect them to automatically leave the program when they're done 
go back and actually start being active in the Hramada. They may or may not be, but that's not the goal of this thing. The goal is to open doors and give people, these students, an opportunity to experience something they may have never experienced before and get, give them an, uh, an opportunity to reflect upon that once they leave, that maybe down the road when they're established or they have time or whatever, they're going to give back to the Hramada in their own way and in their own time. And that was pretty revolutionary at that because people assume a, a quid pro quo typically. But in this case, there was none. So we ran the program, I ran the program, I think it was two or three years, and then it was handed over to the um, Ottawa UCC office at the time. And, and it, it, it ran for a few more years and then it died. And I always wondered why it died because it was such an important uh, vehicle and pipeline for so many students right across the country. Um, and, then, and then later on, because I stepped away from the community for a number of years, later on, I, I heard that it was starting to be revitalized and I thought, well, this is really great. Like, this is really great. Um, it's not, it's fantastic to have an internship program on Parliament Hill for students from Ukraine, wonderful. But it's equally important to have a parliamentary internship program that is robust, large, substantial, and impactful for Ukrainians in Canada, Ukrainian Canadian students in Canada. And so it's wonderful to see. I'm so proud of Roman and Oksana, uh, Roman Vashuk and Oksana Smirachuk because Roman understands and they both understand the importance of having stability and a, and, a, and a financial pipeline to support this program. And at the end of the day, those students will have a lasting legacy of their experience here in Ottawa and in those environments and will have the knowledge and potentially interest in giving back down the road. So at the end of the day, what does SUSC, why, why does this matter, I think? SUSC gave me the chance to create relationships that are lifelong lasting. It gave me the opportunity to experiment and learn confidence. And it also underscored the ability to be bold and bold thinking, aspirational thinking, and then bold doing. And I just think if anyone has that opportunity to go through some kind of experience of that nature through SUSC, uh, through an organization, SUSC would be it. Oh, um, it was great to hear from you and I'm sure others will uh, enjoy hearing about you and your experience as well. Slava Ukraini, Hroim Slava. Slava,